Hello, welcome back. This is part four of making an endless runner in Godot. In this video, we're going to finish making the object pool script that we started making in the last video. And so at the end of this video, the game should look like what you see on the screen here, where all these characters are continuously walking across the bottom of the screen. I'm not going to add interactions in this video, so there are no collisions yet. We'll add that stuff later on. One important thing to note is that all these characters are being taken from a finite pool of objects. So for example, we are not just continually instancing new nodes and having them walk across. That would lead to eventually dozens or hundreds of nodes in the game. Um, they might be off screen, but they would still be um, in the scene tree. And that would really slow down the game because the game would need to process all um, hundreds of these nodes and if these nodes had collision bodies, for example, um, it, it would just slow things down a lot. Um, you'll see more of what I'm talking about once we start coding. Um, but yeah, with that being said, let's get started. Now that we have the code written up to programmatically um, load our list of files, let's go ahead and code up our ready function, which will um, use that code and then um, basically turn those paths into node 2Ds and then add a bunch of node 2Ds to our scene. So what we'll do is we'll iterate through the paths that we get from get full paths. We'll load the resource associated with them. And then what we wanna do is use the other export variable, g copies of each, because we might want multiple copies of each of these resources. For example, multiple umbrages. Um, and then inside this inner loop, we will instance the resource. So create a node 2D. We'll position it to some hard-coded position for now. Um, later on, I'll, I'll make this logic a little more robust. Eventually, what we'll want to end up doing is have some code that kind of positions it randomly within a range. Um, and then what we want to do is add the node 2D, the object, to some global variables that represent the pool of objects uh, that we hold. And so there's two variables here. The first is called gObjectPool. The second is called gObjectPoolAvailable. And so the first one is just like every single object that we have loaded. And the second gObjectPoolAvailable is the ones that are available to be spawned. Uh, this will become a little more clear um, later. But for now, let's just go ahead and append it to both of them. Um, and we'll see how they're used differently later on. And then the final thing we need to do here is just add each of these um, objects to the main scene so that they're actually in the scene and you can see them um, and eventually they can be interacted with. Um, and we're using this call deferred function, um, which basically just does it at a like a good moment in time. Um, and then we're also using add child below node, uh, just so that we can control where in the scene tree uh, the nodes get added. And cool, so you can see that umbridge is getting added to that hard coded position. If you change gpath, the export variable, to a directory, you'll see that a bunch of characters get added. Um, so that's a good start. Now let's head on back over to the object pool script, and we're gonna change how these objects get positioned. Right now, it's just hard-coded. We're gonna add in these three export variables um, that allow us to spawn the objects at a randomized y position um, within some constraints. So we have min y and max y, and the object will spawn in between those. And then we have starting x, so the x position is still going to be hard-coded, but it'll be um, configurable. And then we'll write this function called um, get random global position and it'll take in an object and return a random position for that object. So we can just write a comment. And the reason why we're taking in an object 
you will see shortly. But basically, we don't want to just return some random y within a range. We want to adjust the y according to the object's height. So we will uh, get the object's height. And then we will adjust um, the random y position according to that height. And the way we do the adjustment will ensure that the objects all line up um, according to their bottoms. Um, so basically, like if the height is really big, then you'll subtract more. Um, and then the sorry, yeah, you'll, you'll subtract more, and then the object will be have like a, a lower y value, but the bigger height will make up for it. So for example, here. Um, like if the texture height was 20 and the random value was 200, then the random um, height would be 190. If the height was 10, it'd be 195. So if it was 10, it would spawn further down actually, um, but it has a lower height. And so if actually the, the bottoms of these two objects would line up. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, you can look more into it if it doesn't. And then we'll just use that function above um, instead of hard coding the position. So if we run this, we get an error because the get height function actually isn't defined. This is something that we need to define for our uh, for all our characters, and we'll define this later on for other objects that we use in our object pool. So we'll make a script that will attach to all of our character scenes. And then for now, all we need to do is just add this one get height function. So get height will return a float. Um, right now, I'll just have this return uh, zero and then attach it to all the scenes, which will make writing this a little easier just because I get autocomplete and stuff. So yeah, for now, just return a dummy value. And then this is a little tedious, but we'll go ahead and attach it to all of our scenes. Not actually sure if there's a faster way to do this, but you know, it's only, I don't know, eight, eight or nine scenes. So it's not too bad. I just uh, copy pasted the, uh, the path to the scene and then I'm just putting it in for each one of these or sorry, the path to the script. Yeah, only a few more to go. After this, every character scene will have the same script attached to its root node, the static body 2D. And now we can go ahead and edit this and we get you know the nice autocomplete. And the height that we're going to return is the height of the sprite's texture. And we're going to multiply it by a few scaling factors because the static body 2D or the sprite could be scaled, which we'll kind of see later. Um, but after we do this, then we can run our game and we see nothing because the starting X is out of bounds. So if we modify starting X, then stuff should appear on the screen like so. And then we could also mess around with the Y constraints. And then we see that uh, everything is kind of randomly positioned. And it actually looks like some of the characters are a little bit blurry. So let me just fix that now. Just turn filter off and re-import the textures. And now when we run the game, everything looks good. So for now, I'll just change these parameters back to the values that are close to what we'll be using. Uh, I'll just keep the characters on screen, though, because it's easier to kind of debug. Eventually, they'll, we'll want to spawn them off screen, though. Now that the ready function is basically done, we're going to move on to implementing the process function. And the high level summary of what this will do is we have our pool of characters 
And the process function is basically just going to, at intervals, at intervals of time, it's going to choose one, it's going to make it walk across the screen, and it's going to kind of continuously do this. So the effect is that um, characters are going to continuously be walking across the screen. Since we only have a limited number of characters, we're going to um, need to reuse them. And so, for example, when a character goes off the left side of the screen, we'll move them back to the right side of the screen so that they can again walk across it. So basically, like a character walks across, it gets moved to the right, all the characters on the right are available to walk across the screen. And here I'm just kind of cleaning up some code and adding some more uh, global variables. And the first thing we'll do is um, have this variable time difference, which will be the time since we last spawned a character or spawned an object. Um, and by spawn, I just mean the time when we last kind of uh, started, started making it move across the screen, I guess, in this context. Um, all the characters or all the objects are technically already in the scene, like they're already in the scene tree. So spawning them just means, you know, they're actually going to start appearing and moving across the screen. So the time difference is bigger than some random interval because we don't want this to be completely uniform. That would just look weird. Then we will get an object from the available pool of objects and eventually we'll make it uh, go across the screen. But for now, let's write the code that gets the object from the available pool. And so the point of this is basically that we're going to keep two pools, as we saw before. One is the available pool of objects, and one is the kind of all the objects. And every time through our loop, we're going to call this function that finds an object if it exists in the available pool of objects uh, and returns it and, remo and removes it. And so we don't want to, for example, um, return an object if it's already walking across the screen or going across the screen. We want an object that's available, i.e. one that is off to the right of the screen so we can safely start moving it across the screen. And so we keep track of those in this list called G object pool available. And we're just going to randomly index into it. Um, if the size is greater than zero, um, we're going to return around that random object and then remove it. And then this is the object that eventually is going to start going across the screen. And then once kind of you can note that once we get it, we remove it from the available job. Sorry, from the available objects. So it's no longer um, the next time you call this function, you won't be able to get it. We need to add it back later based on some criteria. And so what we'll do with this available object is we'll set its position again. Um, so we'll say basically set it to the starting position. That's the position we set at the very beginning. And then we will also set its, or sorry, we'll also kind of give it some initial velocity. And we'll call, uh, where were we? We'll call this start function with it. And each, each object needs to implement it. But for characters, for example, that's just going to start it walking across the screen with that velocity. Then we'll update our time parameters. So we'll come up with some new random wait time and we'll update the last spawn time so that uh, we can, you know, spawn another character at some random interval in the future. And we're going to make, uh, similarly to the random Y position, we're going to make constraints that are export variables so that we can control how frequently characters spawn or objects spawn in the UI. And so now that that's done, the last thing we need to do is add back to our available objects pool. Um, 
based on some criteria. And the criteria we're going to use is basically if the object has gone off of the left of the screen, then it's now available again. So if it's walked all the way across the screen, then let's add it in. And we also have this other um, small check dot is inside tree um, that just makes sure that the object is in the scene tree. So if, um, yeah, so if the object is off to the left, then we're going to reset it and add it back to the pool of available objects. And resetting it will just make sure, for example, that it doesn't just keep walking to the left forever. And eventually we'll add some other function in that reset. Um, you'll see later how, how um, it can be useful. So now we need to go back to our character script and actually add some of these functions in that we're assuming exist. So the start function is basically just going to modify some velocity uh, member of the character. And it'll set this and then that'll um, that should make the character move. And then the one other thing it does for the character, at least, is it starts the walking animation. And so we can see that there's an error here. We just needed to define the uh, left bound constant. Okay. Cool. So that's, I'm just giving it a little buffer room, but basically we just want that to, to indicate when an object has gone off the left side of the screen. And then we can reset it and add it back to the available objects and all that good stuff. So we can get back now to adding our character functions. The other function we need to add is reset, which for now we'll just Set the velocity to zero, it'll do more stuff later. And then finally, to make our characters actually move across the screen, we can just add some really simple code in the process function that makes use of velocity and updates position based on it. So now when you run the game, uh, everything actually appears to be working. So the characters are all moving across the screen. It's a little hard to tell if they're being repositioned once they go off to the left side. So we can try to make that more noticeable if we adjust some of these parameters. Well, now the characters are just moving really fast. It's still a little hard to notice. So if we adjust the, the spawn wait time, it'll probably be easier to tell. So yeah, now if you look at kind of the, the right side, you can see that there's there's characters like being added, re-added. I mean, otherwise we would just run out of characters. Um, so yeah, it looks like everything is working well. To end, let's just clean up some stuff. This should be a float, and then we'll reset these parameters, um, make our character spawn off screen. And so when we run our game, it should look legit. This is basically what it'll look like when the game is finished. The one thing that's a little off are the scales of the resources. So for example, the penguin is a little smaller than I have it um, in the shipped game and the characters are kind of a little differently sized. So I'm not gonna show this in the video because I think it's just a little boring, but if you want the exact sizes, you can refer to the GitHub repository or you can just scale stuff yourself. It's, it's kind of like a preference thing really, um, but yeah. That is going to be it for this video.